Very good. So welcome to this first session. We anticipate four evenings to go through the history of this church. Let me know if you're seeing my screen again. Okay, wonderful. So I'd like to begin by saying that this church has gone through a, a lot of transformation over the time. Our history is actually quite fascinating. There's a lot more that I could squeeze into four evenings. Uh, I found so much to explore that I'd love to share all of it with you, but I've had to make some choices about what to share. And as it is, it's a lot. It's four evenings worth. So I hope you'll bear with me. There's a lot to it. I've tried to pick out the highlights to give you an idea of how complex and rich and uh, tangled and fascinating it is to watch how things change over time, the forces that come together and converge on a moment and alter the path that everyone is taking. I hope you have a sense of that as we go through this. Our church is rooted in Puritanism, which we'll talk about at some length. And over the years, we had to evolve with all kinds of new theologies coming in to challenge the puritanical thinking and a lot of changes in society along the way. We had to endure a number of things such as many wars, drought, and the hardships of changing economies and difficult economies. And in the end, I feel that we have emerged as a church in the 21st century. We are now relevant to today's age, we're energized, and we still are true to the Christian fundamentals that we started with. Over the course of this time, you'll see that. So where to begin with this story? There are so many places to begin. If I start later and give you a shorter story, you'll miss a deeper understanding of what got us there and why people did what they did over time. So I'm gonna start way back, not before Christ, but with the printing press. And you'll see how that takes us uh, for, for several centuries after that. But that story makes this, this uh, evening and the next three cover five and a half centuries. But don't worry, it's not gonna be terrible. We'll get through that together. So let's start with the printing press. This German guy developed this up until now. I'm sure you all know, basically, if you wanted to have a copy of something, it was done by hand, preferably in a dark uh, depths of a castle by candlelight in the middle of the night by a monk who swore to silence for 20 years. The printing press changed all that. You could now have copies of things and distribute that around. That was revolutionary, as I'm sure you all realize, because information could travel uh, so far and so fast. The authorities couldn't contain information as well as they could before. So their printing press had an enormous difference, especially 70 years later, when Martin Luther was you know, one of many rebellious monks that we never heard of. We heard of him because of the printing press. His 95 theses made the rounds of Europe very fast within the Holy Roman Empire. A lot of people took, took that up and uh, it resonated with a lot of people. That began the Reformation, which we've all heard of. One of the guys that picked up on this was a French theologian by the name of John Calvin. He was living in Geneva, Switzerland at the time, and he started moving this thinking into his own preaching. He came up with sermon after sermon. They were published and distributed thanks to the printing press. They covered the Holy Roman Empire and beyond. A lot of people took up this thinking. It was challenging. It got them looking at, in new ways at what they become used to. One of the areas, and, and this was uh, Calvinism, the launch of Calvinism that persisted for a long time. This is a map of about that time in history. There was no Switzerland, but there was a confederation of small states. And uh, in, from Geneva, John Calvin wrote his sermons. One of the places that really uh, got interested in all this, just admitting a few more people, uh, was the Dutch. 
a number of people in, in Holland got very interested in Calvinism, turned some thinking upside down. And another place that got very interested was the Scots. Scotland took it up. So Calvinism began moving outside the Holy Roman Empire. But the Dutch were still within the bounds and uh, they were persecuted. A number of people said, we need to get out of Dodge. So they went across the channel to this Eastern end of England, which an area we now call East Anglia. So these Calvinists set up there and up North in Scotland, more Calvinists set up what became known as the Church of Scotland, which was formally founded in 1560. One important difference is that the Calvinists that came from Holland in, and into East Anglia preferred a congregational form of church government, which is very much what we have today. And the basic idea of a congregational polity is that the congregation is the, one, is the ruling body that makes the decisions for the church. Scotland, uh, the Church of Scotland lead more toward Presbyterian, which means that there are elected elders called presbyters who made those choices. None of this resembled the Catholic Church, which was Episcopalian by a polity in which the case there was a hierarchy of people making these decisions. Now in 1534, uh, Henry VIII decided to break from uh, the Roman Catholic Church. His decision had nothing to do with the Reformation. We all know it had to do with very personal and ambitious reasons. As a matter of fact, uh, and, and starting the, launch, the Church of England, he had nothing to do, and he wanted nothing to do with the Reformation. He didn't want that influencing his church because it threatened his position. Along came one of his daughters, we know as Queen Elizabeth. She also, uh, looked down her nose at Calvinism in particular, and during her reign, her clergy persecuted the Calvinists living in East Anglia. They consider them extremists. As a matter of fact, the clergy in the Church of England coined the term Puritan, and it had the connotation of being a stickler. So it was derogatory, but somehow the, na somehow the name stuck, and so these this brand of Calvinists in East Anglia became known as Puritans. I'll just pause there in case there are any questions or any problems with sound. Is there everyone able to follow? Okay, all right, good then. So Puritans, there they were in East Anglia being persecuted by the crown, having a very hard time of it. And uh, there really was no place left to go. Going back to Holland was difficult. Sticking around England was difficult. And along came Deus Ex Machina in the forum of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. There were uh, previous attempts to colonize uh, New England, what we call New England now, but they all kind of fell through. This is the one that worked. In 1628, there was formed. And that for about 10 years was known as the Great Migration. Puritans dug into their deep pockets, found the money to buy passage. They moved their family and belonging across the ocean, almost all of them making it, and then uh, settling along the coastline in New England. So you can see as they would arrive, there were Native Americans already living here. What had happened is that previous explorers who were rather crude, rough types, they happened to bring something called smallpox with them. By the time the Puritans arrived, 90% of the Native Americans in New England uh, had died of smallpox. So that left a lot of land open. And with, the, with those people basically out of the way, the Puritans could start moving inland, claiming land uh, under the authority of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and then setting up their, their farms and, and, uh, and, and settling inland. By five years into the, the Great Migration there, Concord was founded back in the woods. The difference between these people coming in and, and starting to take up land and the people that had come before is that these are Puritans. They were 100% literate, very unusual in this time. The reason the Puritans had 100% literacy 
I'll get to. It's an interesting story, and it's part of understanding what Puritan, Puritanism is all about. That migration ended abruptly with something called the English Civil Wars. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. I can give you just a thumbnail sketch of that. It was actually a series of five civil wars. It's often referred to in the singular, but there were five wars over a period of about 15 years. Basically, there was England, which operated under the auspices of the Church of England, Scotland, which uh, had the Church of Scotland, and then Ireland, of course, which was uh, Roman Catholic. So there was some uh, religious contest among them, but it was a civil war because they were all under the reign of King Charles I. The real contest was between the monarchy and parliament, which was led by Oliver Cromwell. You probably heard his name. They both had armies and they both fought each other in five civil wars. In the end, parliament won. Oliver Cromwell uh, prevailed, captured the king and chopped off his head. There are movies made about that. Uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but he played, uh, played it really well. So from that time on, parliament and not royalty was in charge. They spent some time sending their soldiers around trying to gather up old loyalists, finding them wherever they could. They'd imprison them, often they'd execute them. Uh, at one point, uh, they found a guy named John Law. He was a Scot that had fought against parliament. They put him in prison along with a lot of others. And at some point, parliament and Cromwell realized these prisons are full. We have to get rid of these people. Some of them they've shipped to Australia, some of them they've shipped to the colonies. John Law is one of those that came to the colonies. In fact, he came to uh, Concord. All these people were sold into slavery wherever they went. Concord was populated by Puritans. They didn't know what to do with a slave. It was just completely outside their ethos. So what they did do, there is land, we'll talk about this in a minute, but there was land northeast of Concord that uh, where they could graze animals. So they set up John Law right around where School Street takes a turn toward Route 2. And from there, he tended sheep. The brook that he set next to uh, often became known as Law's Brook. In fact, there's uh, one thing I read said he liked to stay on the far side of Law's Brook from Concord. So the people would left him alone because it was a difficult brook to cross about half of the year. That brook has changed names since, but you'll notice that we have a road named Laws Brook Road. So the name of that road originates all the, to, all the way back to the English Civil War. That's a, that's a tangent to the real story, but I thought it was an interesting one. One year after Concord was founded, Harvard University was founded in Cambridge. And then a few years later, years later, we had the King Philip's War. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's uh, a guerrilla war that happened here in New England. There was a man named Metacomet. He was uh, Algonquin. He was actually the second son of Massasoit. When Massasoit died and his first son died, then uh, Metacomet became the, uh, the chief of the Algonquin. There were a lot of failed attempts to live peaceably with uh, the Puritan settlers. It didn't work out. Metacomet basically uh, lost patience. He gathered up men from various tribes and formed a guerrilla band. The English referred to him as King Philip. So that was the English name that they, he was given. So they ran around basically uh, killing and burning things down. The town I live in is Groton. And during the King Philip's War, Groton was completely destroyed. Anything in Groton that's standing today dates to after this happened. I believe Sudbury was also destroyed. A number of towns were partially damaged. Acton and Concord were not touched. So it just depended on where you were. It didn't last long. And eventually, um, for lack of food and, and other supplies, uh, the, the war ended rather brutally. I won't give you the details. But that happened during this time, as well as the Salem Witch Trials. I won't go into the details, I think everyone's familiar with that. 
And eventually, 10 years after Concord was founded, Acton was founded. Now, there's more to the story, but one thing I want to point out that this is all happening with Puritans who came across from East Anglia and set up settlements here to, uh, to earn a living and live the life that, the way they felt was appropriate. One other thing to point out that's really important is that this is during the Enlightenment. Pardon me, one second. <clears throat> we'll spend a little time talking about why that's important in a bit, but I just want to point out this is happening all at the same time. So we have some converging forces. During the Enlightenment, we have people like Isaac Newton and uh, J.S. Bach, many other names, which we'll mention later. Let's talk a little bit about what it means to be a Puritan. Puritanism is a form of Orthodox Calvinism. I see Apollo here, so feel free to uh, cor correct me anything. I'm, I'm, I'm flying high over what uh, a seminary would learn in great detail, probably getting a few things wrong, but it's, it's, I'm taking literary license just for entertainment's sake. All right, so Orthodox Calvinism, we'll give you the highlights here. I do believe in original sin, as a matter of fact, in the form of total depravity. We're all born this way and we're all stuck this way. They also believe in predestination. Many of us have heard of that. And just for those who can't recall, predestination basically means that God has already decided who's going to heaven and going, who's going to hell. And there isn't a thing you can do about it. It's out of your hands. So that's kind of a tough place to be because there's only the elect few who will make it to heaven. The rest will endure internal uh, torment. If you put that together, that means that God's love and grace is limited to those elect few. And it tends to be thought of in terms of men from everything I've read. Now, here's where something interesting emerges from all this. If you combine this together, there's this huge social pressure to have an outward sign that you are successful, that you're doing well, that you're showing uh, limitless, perfect faith in your beliefs, that you subscribe to everything, you're consistent with the beliefs and the practices that everyone around you espouses. So there's this tremendous pressure to show your faith and to be successful. So people worked hard. The Puritans worked hard to open up land, to raise crops, raise cattle. This is the, oops, this is the source of the Puritan work ethic, this drive to succeed. This is where it comes from. We refer to it, but this is the origin. One other portion of, of uh, Puritanism is the nature of God. All right, they did believe in the Trinity, that Christ was both human and divine, and that uh, Christ was resurrected at Easter. This is the part of Calvinism that survives today in our theology as a generalization. So there's a lot of transformation coming up over the centuries. What else can we say about the Puritans? As I said before, they very strongly favored a congregational polity or Episcopalian. They felt the leaders were accountable only to God, not to the Pope or some other intermediary, just to God. They forbade any musical instruments, anything that would distract from service, from devotion, from attention to God and understanding his word, to listening to the sermons, to make dispense of this, to know how it applies to you. So musical instruments were considered a distraction, as were all the various trappings you might find that they used to see uh, in a Catholic church. The fancy clothes, the, the polished gold, et cetera, et cetera. There was an enormous emphasis on preaching Preachers could go on for hours and you're expected to listen. Husband was a master of his wife and children and accountable for their behavior. And you're standing in the community, you're standing in the church. It was necessary for you to have a clear demonstration of your faith and your commitment to your faith constantly. As we, we know the stockades are 
are associated with Puritans. The punishment for not abiding by all this was rather severe. You could be locked up in a stockade for a while. Now, this one is interesting to me. Every person is personally accountable for understanding the word of God and being able to read it. It was not enough to listen to what the preacher said. It wasn't enough to listen to what your father said. You had to be able to read the Bible yourself and understand it. This is why Puritans were 100% literate when almost all the world was, was the opposite. Puritans were 100% literate. This is going to be really important in the years to come, and I'll, we'll get to that. So this gives you a sense of, of Puritans. In Concord, a bunch of Puritans working hard, trying to make a good show of how successful they are. Many of them had land to work. The uh, primary source of, of wealth was from working the land, from growing apples and other, other fruit, from raising grain and, other, and vegetables, raising livestock. There were some trades. You could be a cooper. You could be a blacksmith. Uh, you could be a farrier. There were sort of the trump trades, but mostly you needed land. The problem with Concord is it was only so big. The Massachusetts Bay Colony had said, this is your grant and you're responsible for making the land better than the way you found it. But if you didn't get a piece of land, there wasn't much left for you to do. So there was an appeal to the Massachusetts Bay Colony to, uh, to say, well, northwest of Concord, there was land that no one was using yet. They said, please, can we have that and add that to Concord? And they said, yes. So for a while, people grazed there. There were a couple of businesses. There was an ironworks that set up there. And eventually, people wanted to start moving in there and, and having property there. But there were years of litigation, 30 years of litigation, arguing about how to divide up the land and allocate it. Finally, once that was resolved, then what became active was open for people to get grants to own property there. So people moved in, and we'll start looking at the timeline more precisely now. Between 1930 and when Acton was founded, people set up shop. Here's a, a very old map of, of the uh, properties that were given to people. You can recognize these solid lines are the roads we know today. The squiggly lines are streams. Notice that there are a lot of little squiggly lines because there are a lot of streams in Acton. I'll show you why that's important. You're a Puritan. You're expected to show up at church every Sunday and no excuses. You need to be there. No soccer practice, no interesting PBS show. You have to show up at church. So that's fine on fair weather days. It's a long trek, but when the weather's good, especially in the dry season, the streams are low and you can cross them easily. But then it's easy, it's easy going when the weather is fair. But in the wintertime, the th the, we know how snow the thick can get, uh, thick the snow can get. And we know that in a, a spring runoff, the streams can very, get very deep. Passage is difficult. So it's difficult to get to church. So everyone in the Acton area said, let's make our own town and build a church closer so we don't have to put up with this anymore. They appealed to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They were granted uh, the right to incorporate. And the stipulation was that they had to build a parish and call a minister within the first two years. And then they could keep their township. I just want to point out, this is the year that Paul Revere was born and the year that Augusta, Georgia was founded. So here's a modern map of the center of Acton, <clears throat> where our church is, the town hall, and the common that we have today. Back then, none of that was there, of course, but there was a town common. It was a very small one at this end. This is a deed. A woman named Anne Cumming took some of her property that she had been awarded or allocated, and she deeded it to the town to use as a common. And that was important because that's where they built the first meeting house. This is a painting of it. Probably many of you have already seen this painting. This was built by a guy named Joseph Barnes. I don't suppose there's any relation, Rick. No. 
I suppose it's common enough that it's possible. But he's, this is the man who built it. The word is from some of my reading that they actually started building before the we were officially given permission to incorporate it as a town because they wanted to get going on it. The uh, painting was handed down through generations from the original builder and a woman by the name of uh, Leah Barnes Gray gave it to our church. who had been in her family for those generations. He gave it to the church in the 60s. And we have that church today. This little, uh, what I'm reading here is on the back side. If you ever have a chance to look at it, you, you'll see that. So Minuteman Road, you might know where that is. If uh, you go to the library or the uh, town hall, this at 37 Minute Man Road is this house. This is the house the very first minister lived in. I believe it's the exact same building today. So it's, it's survived all this time. And you might notice that Minute Man Road is only so long. How did the guy get to the church? Was he going to tack up a horse every time he needed so he would, could go the long way? No, as a matter of fact, if you look very closely, there's a gray line between the today's properties that sort of continues Minuteman Road. And the reality is that the road actually went through at that time. So the minister could walk from his house to the meeting house and back again at the end of the day. That, the properties have been changed since, so the road does not continue as you see here. And it also went in the other direction. And this, this continuous road will be later in not too long. You'll see why that's important to know. The active militia would drill here in the uh, original town common. There's a flat area where that arrow is pointing where they could drill sort of at the top of the hill. It's flat and they, and they had their practice there. Now, to pay for the new building, they sold the pews. Family would have a pew, you'd pay for it. And the money, the proceeds from buying the pew for your family was went into the kitty that paid for a construction that uh, that guy Barnes uh, earned building uh, the church. Here's another picture of the building. There's something very curious. You might have noticed it, you might not have. If you look at the windows, some of these windows are kind of small and in strange places. There's no symmetry. It looks like they were just sort of thrown in there. Well, it kind of worked out that way. You see, when people bought their pews, they didn't necessarily know where the pew would end up. Some of them ended up in a very dark corner of the building. These are literate people who are supposed to demonstrate their faith. If you can't see the Bible to read it, it's kind of tough <laughs> to look like a good Puritan. So these people cut holes in the wall install the window so they could have light where their pew ended up. Very enterprising bunch of people there in act. Okay, uh, here's the original uh, communion set that was purchased by uh, members of the, and we still have this today in the church, I believe. The first minister was uh, Reverend John Swift. He served here for 47 years. It's a long time. He was described as a plain, practical, and serious preacher and a faithful minister. Doesn't that sound like the kind of Puritan we've been talking about? He was right up their alley, just the kind of guy they wanted. And he lasted because he was just the guy they wanted. Interesting thing is some of the things that happened during his service. We changed from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. We, had, we went through the Seven Years' War, and I'll tell you more about that. And near the end there, the Revolutionary War began with the, old, uh, with the uh, conflict there at Old North Bridge. So let's dig into that a little bit. Change the calendars. It's a mystery to some. Every time I read up it, uh, I have to make sense of it all over again. But here's kind of how it worked. Julius Caesar took the old Roman calendar with the help of a Greek mathematician and said, it's not working. Let's make a new calendar. He shortened the months, the 10 months in the original calendar so that he could add two new months, January and February. And then they realized that the length of the year, 365, was not accurate. It didn't keep the motion of the earth and the sun and the moon uh, lined up. So they lengthened the year to 365 and a quarter days 
by the use of a leap day every four years. That worked for a while till the people realized, hey, you know, the spring equinox is sort of getting into the middle of summer. We need to do something about that. For centuries, people noticed it was off and getting worse. So Pope Gregory, with the help of a German mathematician, created the Gregorian calendar. And he said, let's adjust this. Instead of 0.25 days, it's 0.22419. And that would be a much better calendar. That's the calendar we end up with today. The way they did that is, is is they started with the leap years and they said every 100 years we're going to skip a leap year. There would be no leap day. But that wasn't accurate enough. Notice it goes to 22419. So they said every 400 years we'll put the leap day back. So starting in 1600, that would be there'd be a leap year that year. 1700, there'd be no leap year. 18, 1900, no leap year. The year 2000, we had a leap year in February. There were 29 days in February last year. And that's because this is how the Gregorian calendar works. There will be a quiz on this later, so I hope you're taking notes. Now, because, I'll just go back one second here. Notice that the fraction is, is lower, right? It was 2.5 and now it's 2. 0.22419. That means to make the change, you had to take some days out of the year to go from the Julian to the Gregorian. So that was one of the transitions that had to be made. Another big transition is that under the Julian calendar, March 25th was, the, was, was New Year's Day. The Gregorian calendar moved that to January 1st. So now you had this period of about two and a half months where there's some ambiguity about exactly what year it is. So if you take February 16th, how do you know what year it is? Well, this is how they wrote it. They said it'd be 1751 slash two. And that was an indication that if you're still thinking Julian, it'd be 51. But if you're caught up with times and you're Gregorian now, then it would be the year 1752. And you see that in the documents. They started that early and, they, and it went on for a while. Here's a document from Acton Archives talks about February 16th, 1742 slash three. So this was still a practice that was uh, going on before the change and then went on for a little while afterward. At some point they dropped it, everyone was clear. Okay, the Julian is ancient history. We don't have to do that anymore. Seven years war. Seven years war is actually World War I. This was the first world war in uh, earth history. World War I was the second but they started numbering with uh, World War I instead of the Seven Years' War. Let me explain why, what I mean. There were alliances among a number of countries. And just like World War I, as soon as there was a battle between two contending uh, countries, the alliances became involved. And so you had two Axis powers during the Seven Years' War. The North American theater was, is what we call the French and Indian War, because basically, the uh, English and the French involved uh, local tribes in the conflict. This didn't have a big impact on Acton, but men from Acton did serve in this war. There's an interesting story, if you read the biography of George Washington, he was a young Lieutenant in one of the battles during this conflict and he totally botched it. He, uh, he lost badly. The good news is that he learned a lot from that and turned out to be a really good general from, from having those early mistakes during this conflict. Now, we all know we celebrate Patriots Day in Acton. This, the first time it happened was in 1775. And here's, as we know, here's what happened. Minuteman Road actually connected the, the march from Davis Farm all the way to the, uh, the old common and then beyond to Concord. And this is, this is the path that they took. When in reenactments today, we can't take that path because half of it is private property. But it did go by Reverend Swift's house and on, its, on their way, they stopped. He blessed them, the troops on their way. And his son, who's also named John Swift came out of the house with a, a box full of musket cartridges and handed it to one of the soldiers. So everyone was in support. Now, unfortunately, Reverend Swift died that year of smallpox. 
He's buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in town. And his gravestone says that there, that he was a plain, practical, and serious preacher and a faithful minister. Almost 50 years. And he launched Acton and this Puritan um, parish. Now, the interesting thing is that that was 70, 1775 when he died. In 1776, 1796, sorry, Edward Jenner finished his tests on humans for a smallpox vaccine. He had proved it worked in sheep. He managed to prove it worked in humans. And so uh, smallpox vaccine became available not long after uh, Reverend Swift died. The next, now because it was so abrupt, there were a couple of interim ministers that showed up. I only have their names from what I could find. There was also something else heading to Acton, bigger than smallpox. It was actually three waves that combined into one giant tidal wave, Start, starting with the Enlightenment, and I'll go into some detail there. There's something called the Great Awakening. You might or might not be familiar with that, but I'll explain a little bit of that. And then there was Unitarianism, which I'll go into a little bit too. Now, at this point, you might asking, be asking yourself, this is a history lesson. When are we gonna learn about Acton, the Acton Church? You will. What I wanted to try to warn you about earlier is that having a little bit of depth in all these forces will help you really appreciate the change. I could, we could read about the change, but if you have some background, how these things combine to really turn things upside down and change the direction the church had into what we have today. To me, it's much more understandable to digging down into some of these things a little bit. So I wanna take a little more time and go into some of those things. But I'll just pause. If there are any questions or comments, something that I said that you missed, that you really wanted to catch? Okay. Well, I'll keep going. But if you're just slow to get to the mute button, just, just speak up if I'm talking. All right. So the Enlightenment, there's a, a lot out there. I'll just give you the highlights. There's some argument about when it started and when it finished but it definitely happened starting in Europe. So how did it get to Acton, this backwoods farm community? I'll show you how it got there. Acton farmers and, and uh, uh, Acton farmers would take their goods to market in Concord. Sometimes they go all the way to Dorchester or Cambridge to trade or Roxbury, wherever there was a, a market to sell goods. They'd, they exchanged for goods that they needed to, to keep going and they'd get money. And sometimes they would actually pick up a few local newspapers to bring back. Now, remember everyone in Acton was literate. Everyone could read. So you bring back a newspaper and everyone would read it. You would bring information back into Acton from the, wood out, the world outside. Not just newspapers were available, but other publications. Some of the works of these uh, enlightenment thinkers they wrote essays in, and uh, books. These things might come back to Acton as well. All these people could read it and it gave them something to think about. These were challenging ideas. They're very highly challenging ideas. So as they were reading, they would debate. And if they stepped, got a little bit too carried away, there were the stockades. The Puritans would put you right back in your place. I think probably the stockades more than anything is the reason that it took so long for the enlightenment to reach the thinking and influence the thinking in Acton, but it was unstoppable as we'll see. In Europe, there are many, many great names. You probably recognize all of these. If you've read some of these, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, this thinking because of the printing press, this thinking crossed the Atlantic to the colonies where we had some of our own great thinkers, probably too many to name. So I'll just mention a few here. How, how, what were the differences between the Puritan thinking and the enlightenment? In the area of education, the clergy were a source of teaching. The enlightenment thinkers said, you can have secular educators because there are secular, there's secular knowledge to share. What about that source of knowledge? Well, it was basically commonly held beliefs among the Puritans, 
but for the uh, Enlightenment thinkers, they relied on their senses and drew from there and concluded the nature of the world. As to the source of truth, there's no question the Puritans turned to the Bible. But for the Enlightenment thinkers, they broke away from that and they said, we're going to reason based on what we can find and see and smell and touch. We'll use the power of reason and what became scientific method to derive our understanding. As for government and religion, the Puritans saw no difference. It was a theocratic government in Acton. For the environment thinkers, they split the two and they took each one in turn to examine. John Locke said, was the one that said, had came up with the phrase consent of government. And in examining religious institutions, he said, we need to take an unprejudiced examination of the word of God. So it's not just rote learning of what the word means. Let's really think about it with as much of an objective mind as we can. Now, because of that, the Enlightenment came up with all kinds of wild diversion from, from um, you know, Catholic um, theology. Unitarianism did not come from the Enlightenment. Unitarianism arose on its own independently, but because of the advent of the Enlightenment, Unitarianism could come from a very fringe way of thinking to a very prominent way of thinking. We'll talk about that later too. Probably not tonight. That'll probably happen another night. Lastly, Enlightenment looked at the emotions. And just going through this very briefly, they looked at passion. Descartes talked about passions as a receptive state, a passive state where you could be open to God and open to other things. Spinoza talked about affect in his metaphysics, which, which basically is a tome that completely challenged so much of religion at the time. Feelings and sentiments, Blaise Pascal talked about good feelings and corrupt passions and making that distinction. And then finally, the inner sentiments. Rousseau talked about feeling God's power and the goodness of God by contemplating nature. He spent a lot of time out in nature. This is, I'm going through this because all this thinking, all this thought of, of emotion, of, of looking at to nature, of trying to find a direct connection to God, reasoning your way through to what your faith really means, that all culminated into something called the Great Awakening in the United States. With 10 minutes left for tonight, let me go into this. Great Awakening lasted for about 10 years. There were three of them. The first Great Awakening is usually referred to as the Great Awakening. A minister by the name of Jonathan Edwards took all this thinking and he rejected predestination. He rejected everlasting torment. And he says, we have a new sense of what the glory of God means. It's revealed in scripture, it's out in nature. We can find it ourselves. And there was a passion to it. He looked at Christ's majesty and the beauty. It says it's far beyond anything we can understand or express. It's beyond us. And that it's worth being human due to Christ. His divine and supernatural light is what fills us all. This launched a passionate appeal to people to be uh, uh, for salvation through Christ. And what you have to do is confess your sins. It's not a matter of being chosen by God. You need to confess your sins and then you're saved. So a little, this was going on when Reverend, when the Acton Church, the Acton was formed and the Acton Church got started. But it took a while to get here. What was brewing out there looked like this. It was a wave of religious enthusiasm. It hit all the colonies, not just Massachusetts, it was everywhere. And it basically affected people who were in a church. If you weren't part of a church, it kind of passed you by. It involved very powerful preaching, a lot of emotion and power. People who were listening were deeply affected. It made their religious experience intensely emotional. Even to the most average of people, they were all swept up to it. And what came with this was a sense of deep personal guilt for being sinful by nature and that Christ was your salvation. This had a big changes on rituals and what it meant to be pious, what to be, to be aware of yourself as a child of God. 
and it brought division. There were the traditionalists and the revivalists, and they fought more and more. Traditionalists said, we don't want to change our ritual. We don't want to change our doctrine. The revivalist said, I'm either going to ignore your doctrine or I'm going to argue against it. This was what was going on, trying to find its way into Acton. One more interesting side note is that this is the wave that brought Christianity to slaves in the southern states, because it affected states, southern colonies. It affected all the colonies. OK, how does this compare to Calvinism? Well, they got rid of predestination. They got rid of all this stuff. What's left is sin and God's nature. Now, once again, I'm sure Paula would remind me very nicely that I'm glossing over some really interesting detail, but it gives you an idea of what was going on. This is such a right turn from Puritanism. And it's trying to find its way in. So we had all these other influences on top of the Great Awakening coming from the Enlightenment, challenging orthodoxy among the Puritan communities. And there's that other thing coming called Unitarianism that just went charging in. We won't have time to get to that tonight. We'll get to that probably uh, next Monday. So what turned out to be a nice escape from English persecution turned out to be uh, a sitting duck for all these changes in theology and thinking. Next came Reverend Moses Adams. He uh, showed up, wanted to uh, become the preacher. The church made him give 16 sermons before they made up their mind. And they finally called him and ordained him in 1777. Now, in 1749, there was a really bad drought in New England. Streams were dry. There were a lot of wildfires. I think half of Dorchester burned down in that, in that drought. That's the year that Reverend Adams was born. He became an orphan at age seven. He was accepted at Harvard, and he actually moved to Acton, I believe, to become a physician. But at some point, uh, they needed a preacher. And so he was ordained and became our second preacher. He served for 43 years, five years short of uh, Reverend Swift. Here are a bunch of his sermons, about 4,000 sermons, sermons in the course of his time. And then eventually he died as well. I think of natural causes. He actually lived in a different house. This is an old bad picture of the original structure. He had a much shorter walk than uh, Reverend Swift. Now he changed an interesting uh, uh, tradition. There was no, there were no instruments right at this time. They did have a practice called lining out the hymns. The minister would sing a line of the hymn, and then the congregation would repeat that, and then the minister would sing another line, and then the congregation would congregation would repeat that. And they went through the hymn in that fashion. They didn't have hymnals. This is how they did it. This is about the time that they stopped that tradition, 1793. Now, there was a tavern here on the, on the other side of the common called Brooks Tavern. This name is going to come up in later evening. So um, I'll mention it now because it's important to know. For one thing, there, was a, there were two sermons uh, it, during Moses' time uh, running this church. And between the sermons, the men would go across to the tavern, have a beer and, and talk about very important things. What, what the church needed to do, what's going on in the town, uh, you know, maybe uh, the enlightenment. So, and then they would go back across for the uh, second service. Here is a document saying, we're gonna meet at Daniel Tuttle's tavern to have a conversation about something. So there, there are original documents uh, at the uh, Acton Library, showing some of this. Sorry, it's not very legible, but this, because I got this, I think, from uh, Microfiche. American Revolution happened. Now, an interesting thing happened with poor old 
Reverend Adams. He didn't get paid for a while. So to make money, he set up a little store in his house in the Acton Center. He sold things. He also took in students for money. He would teach them. And I think most of his students actually went on to go to college. To give you an idea of inflation during the Revolutionary War, the blue line is the price of silver in the course of the war. And of course, the, uh, the dotted line there is Adam's salary, which was frozen at zero until finally the war was over. Now, the original uh, commitment was to pay him 80 pounds a year as a salary. But after inflation, that was absurd. So they renegotiated to 3,560 pounds. At this time, the word pound and the word dollar were beginning to be used interchangeably. And it wasn't long after this that we only used the term dollar for, uh, for our currency. Now the church, that little parish house was getting a little crowded. So they decided they need to build a new one. We'll tell this part of the story and then I think we'll end for tonight. We'll pick up the rest of the story next week. In 1803, the town formed a committee. They said, we need to have a church, uh, a parish, a meeting hall that's at the geographic center so that everyone is equally burdened to make it to church. They still remember trying to get to Concord to go on Sunday. So the committee looked at Acton. Here's the first meeting house. They figured out where the geographic center is. And they said, okay, well, the second meeting house needs to go there. It's basically where our town hall is today. For reasons I couldn't find, the town accepted it, but then a year later, they formed another committee to do the same thing, and they rejected that committee report. It's now 1804, and the, place is, the church is still crowded. So finally, a few years later, they had a third committee, and they said, committee, just make a decision. We need a new church. It's getting crowded. So they did. They landed on the second meeting house. It looked like this. Notice that it had a steeple. The town carpenter said, we're not getting up there. So they sent four uh, shipbuilders from Boston. And they're the ones who installed the, uh, the steeple on our second meeting house. In back, this was a new luxury. They had uh, horse stables in back. So people who, who had to travel by horse to get to church on Sunday had a place to put the animals, especially if it was raining. So here's the first meeting house. Here's the second meeting house, sheds behind it. Life was good in Acton. They tore down the old one because it was actually falling down and they built a school. This became the Acton Center School uh, for about 150 years. It was during this time the military met Haydn, Boxborough was incorporated. An interesting law was passed at Acton. Up until 1802, hogs were not contained. And I guess that caused a problem for somebody because there was a new ordinance that said, you gotta, you gotta contain your hogs, they're getting in my vegetable garden. So that was on the books. Louisiana Purchase happened because uh, Napoleon had to pay for his very expensive campaigns. And they enlarged the common to look more like this. Now notice it doesn't look quite like today. There are two carriageways here around a common green. It was later changed, but that was the, uh, the, what the common look, looked like when they first enlarged it. Today, it looks more like this. Now, <coughs> pardon me. Notice that the blue line is today's uh, roadway. This explains by the, by the front yard in front of some of the houses there are so long and some of the other houses have a very short front yard to the street. It's because it used to be uniform when they first created the common, but today some houses ended up with a big long front yard. Okay, I think this is probably a good place to stop. Next Monday, we plan to meet again and we'll pick it up from here. We have time for maybe a question if there is one. Otherwise, uh, you can find my email in the church directly. I'd be happy to answer any questions in the, in the meantime. I hope this is helpful. I promise next time we'll start hearing more and more about our church and less about history. Well, thank you all. Have a lovely, lovely evening. I, oh, sorry, I yes.
so this is Charlotte and I have not been with this church for very long. Could you tell me about yourself? How long have you been working on this? Because this is incredible. Well, actually, I joined the church just after the Civil War. I've been compiling my notes since then. <laughs> I worked on it. Uh, I took an interest in this around, uh, I want to say, uh, around 2008 or nine, something like that. Wow. There are, there are a couple of books at the Acton uh, Library. We have an enormous archive in our own church. It's under lock and key because there's some really, really valuable information in there. Uh, and uh, an awful lot is written in cursive. So you can't do a text search of most of the history. Yeah. You have to read it. One of our uh, previous members, um, um, Reverend uh, Ruth Richards, did some of that herself when she was in seminary, did some research. She has a very uh, excellent paper that she did. I don't know how many difficult to read cursive documents she she read to gather some of what she did, but that's also one of the things that I looked at. Ruth is now a member again. She joined last week. Oh, she did. So well, you can get the paper from her. <laughs> oh, I already, I already have it. Yeah. You have it, yeah. Oh, others can, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, she's a little careful. She wants to make sure that she, you know, like any author you want to be careful where it goes but uh but she did you know she does excellent work yeah so are you, uh, i'm sorry i was just gonna say are you a historian or a teacher by trade no i'm afraid not no this is just something that uh i get lost in there and then when i don't want to do my work mm -hmm. or pick up my room that's awesome thank you <laughs> yeah I found myself saying, wow, if I'd had a history professor like Bob, I might have paid attention. Oh, all of mine were it's really great. One, all of yeah. mine were really awful. Yeah. 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 And they were always at eight o'clock in the morning with slides. <laughs> yeah. And they and their voice only varies by a small pitch. Yeah. You know. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, Bob, this is Tom. Um Tom. I, yeah. Hey, buddy. I was wondering if you came across anything that indicated, you know, how Swift handled uh, some of those uh, things going on. I mean, he was there obviously for a while and sounded like an awful lot was coming in and potentially changing. And any any sense of, you know, did he just let the congregation sort of figure it out in, in that tradition? Or did he you know, take a stand or, uh, you know, direct from the pulpit sort of thing? That's a great question, Tom. I didn't see anything that actually laid that out. There's, there's not, if, if there are um, personal diaries or anything, any, any uh, firsthand sources that would answer that, I haven't come across them. What I gathered though, is that there are two forces. Number one, it was a congregational polity, which means the, the minister had a role but he wasn't running the church, right? It was, it was the congregation. And the other thing is that the social pressure from people to uh, conform was enormous, right? They had stockades, right? They would lock you up and leave you out overnight if you, if you did things uh, not the right way. There was tremendous pressure. And, and I guess there's a third that people internalize this belief system right? I need to look good. I need to comply. I need to show that I am abiding by the faith that I've learned that the people around me follow. And so I will self-censor, you know, I'll control my own thoughts and my behavior. So there, are, there was already a lot in place that I think just kept people in line without having uh, the pressure on the minister to enforce, you know, proper thinking. That's, that's my interpretation. I, I, I don't have anything to point to that says that explicitly, but just from my reading and thinking, this is where I came out. I don't know if that helps. But that does help. Question. It makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Bob. Well, we are over. I don't want to hold people for too long. We'll have at it again in a week. Hopefully this is uh, easy to follow and, and not too tedious waiting for the word act and show up more, but we will get there next week. I thank you all for coming. And it's nice to see you all. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Terrific. Really great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.